Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrea Amber, and I'm a senior lecturer in genetic engineering at the University of Bristol. It is a great honor to have been invited to deliver this presentation for the 50th anniversary of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Nilo Consoli, who invited me to deliver this talk. So, in the next presentation, I'm going to talk about some recent soil modeling development applied to the field of offshore geotechnics that have been carried out in Bristol in collaboration with partners all around the world. As you know, the world is facing an unprecedented climate crisis, and green energy plants have been now thriving all over the world. The offshore wind uh, industry has played a key role, and you can see here on the right hand side how the uh, offshore wind capacity has been increasing all over the years, with only 3 gigawatt in 2010 to more than 29 gigawatt in 2019. And there is a prediction that we will exceed more than 200 gigawatt by 2030. This is due, this increase is due to the number of wind turbines installed, but also to the size, as you can see in the cartoon on the uh, bottom of this slide, where the uh, size of the wind turbine has been increasing to the year and is compared to the typical size of the Boeing 747 and you can now appreciate the huge size of the latest installed wind turbine. Now the main hub of wind turbine installation has been indeed North Europe where UK, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark and Belgium has played a key role but now new uh, wind farms have been currently installed in East Asia, in China and Taiwan, but also Japan is considering that, and in USA. Brazil will probably be next in the list, as we have recent news from August 2020 that, uh, uh, about the licensing of two new offshore wind farms of about 4 gigawatt in Rio and Espirito Santo. Now, when we talk about offshore wind turbines, we need to think about how, about the foundation system. And typically, we have two families of foundation system. We have fixed bottom offshore wind farm for shallow seabed, or then, if we go to deeper water, we have to conceive different type of foundation and different type of wind turbine. In this case, the uh, current trend is to consider floating structure that will be anchored to the seabed to uh, moving system. In this presentation, I will talk I will talk about both types of turbine, but let's now start with the fixed bottom offshore wind farm. So the fixed bottom offshore wind farm uh, are the winter type of wind turbine that has been installed so far, um, well, the, 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 the most majority of them. And different type of foundation has been selected to provide the stability to this wind turbine. We can enumerate among them the gravity base, the monopile, the suction bucket, but also uh, multiple jacket piles. The selection of the type of foundation, broadly speaking, depends on two main criteria, that is the depth of the water, but also the depth of the bedrock. Here, on the right hand side, you can see the statistic of the, of the use, type of foundation used in previous projects, and you can see the monopile as the largest share, counting for more than 80% of the installation. For this reason, in the next, uh, um, next part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about monopile foundation. But remember that all the main principles are applicable to other type of foundation as well. So if we now consider a typical monopile offshore wind turbine, and we consider the loading system over its, its design life, the excitation, loading excitation, is due to the wind, to the wave, but also to the rotation of the blade and of the rotor. All this will impose a quite uh, um, complex loading regime on the, on the wind turbine, and especially a very large number of cyclic loading over the design life, that is typically 20-25 years. The technical engineer needs to ensure the stability and serviceability of the wind turbine over this design life, and they have to satisfy several design criteria. So we need to ensure that the maximum displacement rotation of the wind turbine is within acceptable limit, but also there is a, a key point here, that uh, is that the turbine must, must not go under resonance. So we must make sure that the overall turbine uh, as a natural frequency that uh, lies within some narrow bands that are uh, here in this uh, picture on the bottom right hand side of the, of, the, of the slide. So basically the foundation system must be tuned such that the turbine 
natural frequency doesn't overlap with the auto frequency, the, with the blaze passing frequency, but also uh, the frequency of the excitation of the wind and, and the waves. So, in order to satisfy the two design criteria, we need to carefully understand the uh, monopile behavior under lateral loading. And this is done using two main procedures. One, we can do a 1D simplified analysis, where the pile is modeled like a beam and the soil like a set of springs. Or we can do something more accurate using 3D phantom element analysis, in which we can model the full geometry of the pile, so its diameter, that uh, are as a, a crucial role in this analysis because remember that now the diameter we are going to use are about 8 to 10 meters so they are very large diameter more monopile but also we can model in a more accurate way in 3D fine analysis the soil constitutive behavior but well, what, are, what are the downsides? Basically, 3D fine analysis of this large system comes to the expense of time and, and computation so most of the time 1D Pile soil analysis I prefer if we need to run uh, several simulation. The recent PISA project has bridged the, the gap between the two types of approach by using 3D finite element analysis to derive more accurate uh, soil spring to use to be using 1D simplified analysis. And it's for this reason that here you can see both uh, horizontal soil reaction moment soil reaction that arise from the uh, large diameter monopile and the shear stress that that basically uh, originate on both sides of the monopile when this is lo lateral loaded but also the uh, horizontal and base reaction that now play a crucial role because of the large diameter of this monopile if we now focus on the 3D finite element analysis, that is the more complex and more accurate, one key ingredient here is the choice of the acoustic modeling. And if we look at the literature, now we can we can we have a greater selection. Uh, we can go from very simple model, so rigid plastic, linear elastic, or linear also plastic, to very complex modeling like banding surface or kinematic adding model. But there is one key aspect that is still uh, basically a challenge for uh, uh, soil modeling. That is basically the prediction of the long-term cyclic low loading response. That is key in offshore wind application that in 20-25 years this structure was subjected to a very large number of cyclic loading. So, in order to understand what is this key modeling challenge, let's analyze the behavior of a complex model, like a banding surface uh, plasticity model under both monotonic and cyclic loading behavior. For this exercise, I'm now considering a triaxial uh, soil sample that is subjected to a, a two triaxial test condition. So we have an horizontal stress, we call it sigma r, and a vertical stress, sigma a, that we are going to increase for uh, apply shear to the sample. We can define Q, that is the deviator stress, as the difference between the two stresses, sigma a minus sigma r, and P is the uh, average of the three stresses in three dimensions. So sigma r plus two sigma sigma a plus two sigma r divided by three. We are going to now show the behavior of the sample in three different planes. So the stress plane, Q versus P dash, while our sample will start from isotropic condition, so no sheared, and then will be sheared at uh, constant P dash. We will show the stress strain behavior and also we will analyze what's happened on the specific volume isotropic stress plane, where our sample will be start from a dense uh, density state. In banding surface model, we need to define different model ingredients. The first one is the elastic properties. So we need, we need to define the size of this surface. So uh, the surface binds, bounds a region where the soil behaves elastically. And then we need to define our elastic properties, that is typically an elastic stiffness and the Poisson ratio. Then we need to define what's happened at the large strain and typically we can uh, frame our model in a critical strain framework. So we need to define a uh, strain, a critical state, but also a final density state. And you can now see that if, if, if we define the critical state line in the QP dash plane, we can now define the strain a very large strain by projecting our stress path on the critical state, as I've done here. We need to find now what is uh, the, the banding surface. The banding surface tells us what is the current strength. So the, car, the strength available at each time of loading. And typically, this is related to the state parameter. So the state parameter is the distance between the, our current density state and the density state at the critical state. We define this as psi and is positive if the 
our soil is denser than the critical state condition. If we use tip psi, we can use tip psi to basically scale up the slope of the critical state line. So for a dense soil, our abundant surface is steeper or larger than the critical state. So basically, we now have a strength, peak strength, that is larger than what's happened, a large strain. We can now define, must define a stiffen evolution rule, where basically that is the degradation rule between the, our initial elastic stiffness to this point where our stiffness, you can see, there must be zero. And this is done to a rule that links our elastic stiffness with the strain, or in this case, with the distance of our point to the image or its projection on the bounding surface. And as we approach the bounding surface, basically our tangent shear stiffness must become zero. And this is done in most model to an hyperbolic rule. And if we use this rule, now we can see that we got our nice peak post-peak behavior. You may ask how we go from this peak behavior to the final state, and this is due to the fifth, basically, ingredient of the bounding surface model, that is the latency rule. The latency rule tells us that basically our um, specific volume must tend towards the critical state at large strain, and basically psi must go to zero. If psi goes to zero, basically this uh, factor here goes to zero, so our abundant surface will now tend towards critical state, and our peak strength, or our current available strength, will now go to critical state. That's why we have this nice peak post-peak behavior. This is working very nicely for dense soil, but it's also working quite nicely for loose soil condition. Now you can see here I have now uh, consider a loose initial loose soil state. Our now uh, set parameter psi is negative. For this reason now our bounding surface is lower than the critical state. So basically our strength, our uh, target strength is now lower than, the, when the, than the, the critical state and we don't have any more the peak condition and as we load our peak strength that is now lower than, than the critical state we slowly try to go towards the critical state condition and that's why we have this nice increasing trend of uh, stress without a, any peak. So the model is working very well both for uh, dense and loose state but now let's see what's happened during cyclic loading. So now consider if we load the soil between these two points up and down. So in the first loading condition the soil will basically behave like a monotonic condition and this is a typical monotonic trend. Then when we allot the soil will basically allot in this way where it's that is stiffer than what's happened in, in loading because our image point when we load is somewhere down here and this point is basically more distant to his image than the, in, than the initial condition. If we now keep loading up and down when we go up we have a similar behavior as the first cycle when we load similar behavior to a second cycle and if we keep loading we have very similar, similar uh, behavior and you can see that we have limited stiff, stiffening but a lot of ratcheting well ratcheting I mean a lot of uh, accumulated plastic deformation and every cycle look very much the same as each other because basically every time we load and, uh, and unload the soil is almost at the same condition where we have just very tiny changes in density between one cycle and the other, so very tiny change on the bounding surface slope, but very tiny that are not visible uh, in our results. And to demonstrate that, I'm now showing here some, some, some comparison between uh, modeling and experiment. So the black line are our uh, model prediction with the bounding surface model, and the red line are our triaxial experiment. And you can see that while in triaxial experiment we see all this stiffening and very uh, and a decrease in plastic de de deformation accumulation, our model over, -pred over predict all the all the plastic de deformation. You can see here on the bottom figure how the cyclic cumulative strain for the model are basically uh, much larger than those measured in the experiment. And you can see this is due because it, in every cycle, we basically are in similar condition as cycle one. So we don't have a memory of what's happening in the past. And that's why 
our proposal is actually to introduce a memory hardening surface model. So the idea is to introduce this memory surface, and the memory surface is a, a surface that bounds a stress region that the soil feels to have already experienced. So if we are in this stress region, the response is stiffer. So why, what is this uh, evolution? So this memory surface must track all the stress state that we have experienced. So if we do a monotonic loading, this, this memory surface must increase, such as the region in which we are stiffer is, the soil behavior is stiffer is increasing. But if we go to large stress ratio, the, 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 the surface must shrink. This is like in life. If you start remember what's happened in the past, but as you get old, you may forget something that happened ve very long time ago. And this is the same mechanism that memory surface is, uh, is modeling. But what's happening in cyclic loading? As in life, when you travel to the, the, to the same place, you, you become faster and you see a little bit around the boundaries. The memory surface, if you travel inside the memory surface, the memory surface increasing such that you be, your behavior becomes stiffer, but also is also in increases. So basically, uh, with cyclic loading, the memory surface is is um, is basically uh, increasing in size. Now this concept has now been introduced into different uh, soil models. That is the seven turn sand that was developed in Bristol, and in the sunny sand that is large available in many FE package. And we call the second one sunny sand MS, where MS stands for memory surface. I have to say that the memory added surface model is just a modeling feature that can be added at any um, in any baseline constitutive model, and we have choose these two uh, uh, for, for for the moment. So the question is, how many model parameters do we need? Because this is the typical question that the technical engineer, especially in practice, they ask us. So the model parameters needed are those of the baseline model, and then we have other two parameters that are related to the memory surface. One, they tell us how much is the um, soil stiffest when we are inside the memory surface. A second, how quick we must uh, be the shrinkage if we go to high stress uh, ratio. The two additional model parameters related to the memory under surface, the first one, the stiffening parameter, can be calibrated against a triaxial, cyclic triaxial test. So if we have the trend of accumulated, accumulated elevatory strain versus the number of cycle, like you can see in this picture, where the experimental um, results are uh, represented by this circle, we can now tune the stiffening parameter me to such that our prediction matches the experimental trend. You can see here the trend that we would get without the introduction of memory surface. We can now uh, try progressively increase this parameter mi uh, to move this line downwards, as you can see by this arrow, until we basically we don't our prediction, they don't match the experimental trend. Now, the calibration of the other model parameter that govern the shrinkage of the memory surface is basically uh, can done against uh, the interaxial test, but is, uh, um, yeah, it has no relevance when we are trying to model uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 the strain or displacement accumulation under the cyclic loading. So I will not tackle this uh, uh, issue in this presentation. I would like to show you how the uh, soil behavior changes with this parameter me. So we have here some triaxial compression test with 1,500 cycles that have been followed by a reloading of the sample. And you can see that the increase in size of the, in size of the memory surface with this cyclic loading is tuned automatically by the, by the model, such that then when we reload the sample after cyclic loading, we join what we would expect to be the monotonic low loading behavior. And this happened for different all the values of me, where this value of me, so not only basically govern the amount of accumulated plastic deformation that are basically developed during cyclic loading, but also uh, govern the uh, amount of stiffening we have after the, uh, the, 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 the cyclic loading. And basically this is the feature that allows us to only use one single parameter to govern the increase in size of the memory surface during cyclic loading. Now we have uh, uh, we have tried to uh, 
challenge validity model against a lot of numerical set of results. Here you can see on the left hand side some simulation of the interaxial uh, test against laboratory test of Wickman and we have now tested uh, uh, the effect of cyclic ramp do, the effect of uh, uh, density of the soil, the, the effect of uh, uh, average test ratio and we are still continuing the challenge of the model. One thing that I want to show you uh, for the undrained simulation is basically the capability of the model to, and the importance of the, this model to uh, record the uh, stress history. So here we have some undrained cycle that are, um, that are basically um, applied after the application of some cyclic the preloading cycle. So in the top figure you can see simulation if we apply directly the undrained cyclic loading and in the bottom picture you can see if we do this undrained cyclic loading after we, after we apply this uh, cyclic drain preloading and you can see how the behavior of the soil completely change so we take much more cycle to go to liquefaction when we apply this cyclic uh, drain preloading and this is due thanks to the introduction of the memory surface that record the stress history of the soil in the past and you can see here the simulation between uh, uh, experiment in uh, in uh, uh, in black and uh, and the uh, model prediction in red for different amount of cyclic preloading. And you can see how we can uh, accurately predict the pore pressure build up according to the uh, cyclic stress history. So we have now implemented our uh, um, model uh, in, uh, so the sunny sand MS version in, uh, uh, in FE, and you can see in uh, OpenSys, and you can see now uh, the, uh, the simulation of the uh, pile behavior af after a storm. You can see on the uh, top right side the, uh, the, the loading history that we have applied to the pile. And you can see how the model can predict the increase in density around the pile and, and the progressive uh, uh, the deformation. And applying this, we can now predict uh, what is the tilt, after, uh, the tilt and deformation after a storm. We are now trying to validate the model against uh, uh, a la large the, the, the data set of tests. These are some uh, examples of, uh, uh, of simulation for uh, cyclic lateral loading. So I'm plotting here moment versus pile at, uh, at rotation and you can see how the uh, pile behavior becomes stiffer as, uh, as we move uh, uh, with number cycle and uh, the um, progressive accumulation of rotation decreases with the number of cycle. If we plot this versus uh, the number of cycle, we can see now this bilinear trend and this is done for different uh, loading conditions, so different value of uh, uh, cyclic amplitude and different value of, uh, of the, well, this is the ratio between the cyclic amplitude and the, and the uh, maximum capacity of the pile. So this is done for a calcium sense, that is the same sense that we use in our uh, validation of the soil energy model. But we, have, we can now make a qualitative comparison with what we can see, uh, we have seen in one G experimental test result by LeBlanc in, on a different type of sand. What is remarkable uh, is the very similar shape of the, um, of the strain, uh, of, the, of the rotation accumulation. You can see that this bilinear, um, bilinear trend is also seen in these one G experimental results. And we are now performing further validation challenges of this, uh, of this model, FE model. Okay, let's now focus on the second part of this presentation, that is anchoring system for floating offshore wind turbines, but also for other energy devices. So, as we are seeking more energy resources, we are moving further ashore in sites where there is deeper water. And in deeper water, fixed bottom solution becomes uh, unfeasible and uneconomical. So uh, people are studying now uh, this floating wind concept. And there are several types of concepts that has been developed in, uh, in different places of the world, but they can basically be categorized under three family that are spar buoy, semi submersible and tension leg platform, as you can see here. Pilot scale has now been deployed around the world, so we can have, for example, this idle concept in France, the wind flown Atlantic off the coast of Portugal, but also Iowa Scotland. 
but remember that uh, uh, NT's, NT's structure needs to be uh, are floating needs to be anchored to the soil. But remember that uh, we will talk about anchoring the, in the next slide, but anchoring system, the same concept is also applicable to other devices like wave energy devices, as you can see here on the uh, bottom left uh, um, picture. So which anchoring system can we use? So far, so far the most uh, common type of uh, um, anchoring system use are the dark abandoned anchor that has been used for example in Adeol and in Wind Float Atlantic or suction anchor that has been installed in Iwin Scotland. But we can also conceive that in future we can use driven pies, drill and gravity pies depending on the soil condition, gravity anchors but also other type of anchor like torpedo pies, depla and sepla where depla stands for dynamic and body plate anchors and sepla for suction and body plate anchors. I had the, uh, the fortune to be collaborating with the people in UWA at, uh, in Australia and to study more the, basically the behavior of, uh, of plate anchors that is a potential candidate for future wind and wave uh, the development. So we now in this case we studied the behavior of the anchor using a small scale model in the in the centrifuge. The centrifuge is a very pow very powerful tool because by spinning uh, our uh, box with a model of our system we can basically reproduce uh, we can basically scale up the system to reconduce stress and dimension and uh, uh, the, the dimension that are represented in the field. So in this case if we test uh, we spin our centrifuge at 50 g a 20 millimeter anchor like you see in this picture is equivalent to a one meter anchor and stress is always scale, scale up by 50 g so what we studied um, you know that uh, strength and stiffness in soil is not a constant value but they change with time they change with stress history as we have been discussed in the past in uh, in the previous uh, presentation so here what we want to study what what was the effect of the cyclic loading on the final capacity of the anchor? So basically we took an anchor in sand and we subjected, first we loaded it uh, uh, in a monotonic way and you can see the uh, behavior that we had in uh, where we now represent a force versus the displacement of the of the line that is basically the, the, the moving line, the, the chain connecting to the, to the anchor. And the black line is a typical monotonic behavior. Now uh, after that, we actually use, we actually subjected the anchor to a regime of cyclic loading to uh, simulate a storm, and then we loaded it to, to to failure at the end. And you can see with the color line how the um, final capacity was increased by the, uh, the the cyclic loading history. And this can be easily explained if we now take back the, our previous concept of the of the soil element, because if we look what's happened to our uh, soil element in front of our anchor, you can see here, for example, uh, in an extract of a section of uh, an anchor loaded in uh, in our model, and if we take, for example, a soil element in front of the anchor, we can expect that during cyclic loading, this soil densify, and if the soil densify, if you remember the concept of the state parameter, state parameter will increase, so basically our strength must, current strength, according to the bandage surface model, should increase as well. The second aspect that we look was is that the basically the dependency of the anchor capacity or anchor strength on the velocity of loading, and you can see here how the uh, anchor capacity versus the normalized line displacement is changing if we increase the capacity the the loading rate, where v is the basically. A normalized or a dimensional uh, lo loading rate that is defined down here that is dependent on the coefficient considered so the soil on the diameter of the anchor on the uh, on the velocity of loading but also on the viscosity of uh, the fluid because in sometimes in in uh, centrifuge testing we would like we and we would like to use a, a fluid that is different from water and you can see how going how increasing the loading rate actually we increase the capacity and this is, can be explained because we now go from drain condition at very low uh, low, uh, low low velocity like we can see here to undrained condition and if we now consider again what's up uh, the our soil element framework and we consider a dense soil basically this can be easily explained by projecting what's the stress path on the specific volume 
p-dash play. In a drain condition, we would like to get to go to the critical state at the same uh, p-dash as the initial one. So our strain projection will be this one, like you can see in uh, in uh, the left hand side figure. But as we increase the loading rate, basically we are um, triggering a poor pressure gen generation. And in this case, since the soil is dense, the pore pressure generation will be negative and our final point, projection on the critical state line, will be different until we get to undrained condition where we now, we our final point will be a very large speed dash and we have basically a strength envelope that is much higher, a, strength, a final strength that is much higher than what we would have in the condition. If this can be now explained in this framework where this is the behavior that uh, the increases strength from drain to undrained condition that we will have for uh, a dense soil. But if now our soil would have been loose, so if the behavior was contractive instead of uh, uh, dilate, the, the trend would have been uh, different with, um, with uh, a final strength and drain condition lower than the one in drain condition. Our main contribution to the project was basically to devise a modeling technique to be able to capture what we have seen in the experiments. In this case, instead of using the conventional finite element technique, we opted for using a macro element modeling approach, in which basically the system of anchor chain is replaced by a complex springs. We base our development on some uh, uh, on the uh, on the CASPA model, also developed by UWA, where the chain anchor system is divided is considered as two separate elements. We need to understand what is the what are the forces of the chain, and for this we use the chain law solution by Neuberg and Randolph, and then we work on the anchor response. In the CASPA model, the response of the anchor in the macro element modeling framework is is basically modeled as a complete, perfectly plastic behavior. Just to let you know, macro modeling means that it's the same as a quantitative model, but is applied to a geotechnical system. So what in soil element and the quantitative model is stress now becomes force, what is strain now becomes displacement. So to show you how the system works, let's now, uh, you, let's now um, represent this 3D surface in 2D. And you can see that the uh, anchor capacity surface can be uh, the, can be represented to this uh, to this line. In the conventional CASPA model, our load states always lie on the cap capacity surface, so where the anchor is also uh, always at this uh, at its capacity at failure condition. Basically, what we have done here, we have introduced some additional feature. First of all, we have allowed the load state to become to stay inside the capacity surface, so we can load, we can uh, we can basically model the whole process of anchor loading from zero load to to the failure. We have now introduced also the new feature called the plastic potential. It is basically the respective of the latency rule for constitutive modeling, but in this case we don't know what is the latency in terms of displacement. And the main advantage of this is that it allows us to uh, control the trajectory of the anchor. And finally, in order to capture what we have observed in the experiment, we must include the effect of pore pressure generation or density changes uh, in soils ahead of the anchor. So what we have done, we have introduced a representative soil element that is a typical soil element in the front of the anchor that is loading in a similar way how the anchor is loaded. And to this soil element, we can now monitor what are the increase in pore pressure or the change in density, map that to change in soil strength that will affect the anchor capacity. Because imagine this anchor capacity uh, will depend either in the ratio strength or in the friction angle, current friction angle, peak or critical state of the soil ahead of the anchor. So we have applied this, uh, uh, we have uh, challenged this new model in uh, towards uh, a lot of uh, different uh, um, available results. You know, scientific results are not so popular, so sometimes we have to use some simulation to FE, like we have done here. And you can see uh, some simulation for different uh, of a ver vertical anchor, now loaded vertically, for different, for different exit ratio of the loading, so for different distances of these um, of the pad eye, we call it EP is the pad eye, that is the point in which the chain 
is attached to the ankle, so the distance from the pad eye to the ankle. And you can see our, our model can well predict the load displacement behavior of the ankle, but also the trajectory. You can see this vertical displacement versus horizontal displacement is the trajectory of the ankle. And this is thanks to the plastic potential. The good news is actually, while we introduce four new parameters, we actually found well, four, four new parameters, three related to the plastic potential, one to the other in rule. We found that two of them, we challenged them, I guess, six, seven mm, set of data, were basically constant. And only two of them, they need to be calibrated. And they actually lied also within a quite narrow, um, narrow range. That is a good news for the use of practice of the, of the model. We also start to do some simulation to see how the uh, how we could predict the change in strength and stiffness to the design life of, of an anchor. And you can see how we can qualit qualitatively predict the increase in uh, uh, capacity after cycle loading of the anchor, but also we, how we can predict the independent capacity of the anchor. Further validation are uh, still ongoing at the, in these uh, this two aspects of the behavior. This brings me to the end of my presentation. As you have seen, offshore wind energy is currently thriving and is playing a key role in helping us to meet in the demand for increased uh, green energy. But there are still challenges in the design of this uh, offshore structure, especially in the modeling of long-term cyclic loading, but also in capturing the change in strength or stiffness during the design life of this infrastructure. And we've seen that memory of past history is a key element in any modeling development. If we want to get accurate prediction of the soil behavior and, uh, and the infrastructure. We have tried to, uh, to fill this gap by introducing uh, the memory surface concept in constitutive modeling, but also the concept of a representative soil element in macro element modeling. And we hope that this contribution will help the advancement uh, of the um, discipline, but also solve some of the challenges faced by geotechnical engineers in the field. I would like to end my presentation uh, acknowledging all my contributors, but a special thanks also to Professor Nilo Consoli, not only for inviting me to this presentation, but also for the fruitful research collaboration that we had in the last uh, years. And I would like to extend my thanks also to Professor Lucas Festugato, that has been collaborating with me quite closely in the last few years. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. <music>